brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that shares your values. More information is available at CharityMobile.com. Late on Friday, a document was released signed by Bishop Strickland of Tyler, Texas, Bishop Athanasius Schneider, a couple of other bishops, as well as Father James Altman, and numerous other Catholic public figures, in which a public correction was issued of recent statements by Francis, where he just flatly teaches condemned errors of Luther and rejects the Council of Trent's teaching on who may receive the Eucharist. This statement has already elicited a rather strong response from the pro-Francis wing of the modernist church, and by the time you're seeing this, it's probably gotten worse than what I'll show you at the end of this episode today. But let's go over this statement because it's very clear that Francis stands in opposition to a statement by the Council of Trent that comes with an anathema attached to it, which is kind of a big deal. So let's dive into this topic because it's important. But first, as we like to do from time to time, let's actually check in with Paca Papa Francis and see what words of wisdom he has imparted upon the faithful. Because as what I'm going to show you here, it's relevant to our topic. As Francis returned to his, from his trip to Kazakhstan, where he publicly rejected Christ's teaching that Christ is the only way to the Father, Father by signing a statement claiming that God wills a multiplicity of religions, it came out, came out that while in Kazakhstan, Francis had met with priests and religious and told them the following, quote, We must make room for the laity, and this is a good thing, lest our communities become rigid or clerical. A synodal church, journeying towards the future of the spirit, is a church that embraces participation and shared responsibility, end quote. Yes, that's a lot of buzzwords and nonsense for making the church more in tune with the values of the world. Francis really, though, will not give up his hatred for all things rigid. Nowhere was that more evident than in his document Desideria Desiderave, which contained a statement endorsing sacrilegious reception of the Eucharist by Moloch ritual supporting Catholic politicians. A number of high-profile Catholic faithful, myself included, signed a public statement issuing a fraternal correction to Francis on those statements in that document, and it was published by LifeSite News. Here's the full text of that public correction from LifeSite News, quote, The recent apostolic letter, Desiderio Desideravi, given on June 29, 2022, the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul, states, The world still does not know it, but everyone is invited to the supper of the wedding of the Lamb. See Revelation 19.9. To be admitted to the feast, all that is required is the wedding garment of faith, which comes from the hearing of the word. See the letter to the Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. The natural meaning of these words is that the only requirement for a Catholic to worthily receive the Eucharist is possession of the virtue of faith, by which one believes Christian teaching on the grounds of its being divinely revealed. Moreover, in the apostolic letter as a whole, there is silence on this essential topic of repentance, for sin, for the worthy reception of the Eucharist. This natural meaning contradicts the faith of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has always taught that in order to receive the Holy Eucharist worthily and without sin, Catholics must receive sacramental absolution, if possible, for any mortal sins they may have committed, and obey all other laws of the Church concerning reception of the Eucharist. As, for example, the laws concerning fasting prior to reception of the Eucharist. However, if a Catholic is unable to confess mortal sins, but has a grave reason for receiving the Eucharist, such as a priest who may be required to celebrate Mass at a given time, but who is unable to go to confession, such a person may be confident to the best of his ability that he have perfect contrition for any mortal sins that he may have committed. The claim that faith is the only requirement for worthy reception of the Holy Eucharist was condemned by the Council of Trent as a heresy. The Holy and Ecumenical Council of Trent decree concerning the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist, dated October 11th, 1551, chapter 7. The preparation that must be employed to receive the Holy Eucharist worthily, if it is not becoming for anyone to approach any of the sacred functions except solemnly, Certainly, the more the holiness and the div divinity of this heavenly sacrament is understood by a Christian, the more diligently ought he to take heed, lest he approach to receive it without great reverence and holiness. See Canon 2. 
especially when we read in the apostle those words full of terror. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh judgment to himself, not discerning the body of the Lord. See 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29. Therefore the precept, let a man prove himself, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, must be recalled to mind by him who wishes to communicate, meaning receive. Now ecclesiastical usage declares that this examination is necessary, that no one conscience of mortal sin, however contrite he may seem to himself, should approach the Holy Eucharist without a previous sacramental confession. This, the Holy Synod has decreed, is always to be observed by all Christians, even by those priests on whom by their office it may be incumbent to celebrate, provided the recourses of a confessor be not lacking to them. But if in an urgent necessity a priest should celebrate without previous confession, let him confess as soon as possible. See Canon 11. If Anyone see, says that faith alone is sufficient preparation for receiving the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist, let him be anathema. This claim also contradicts Canon 915 and 916 of the Latin Code of Canon Law and Canon 711 and 712 of the Eastern Code of Canon Law. The Latin Code of Canon Law number 915 states, those who have been excommunicated or interdicted after the imposition or declaration of the penalty and others obstinately persevering in manifest grave sin are not to be admitted to Holy Communion. 916 states, a person who is conscious of grave sin is not to celebrate Mass or receive the body of the Lord without previous sacramental confession unless there is a grave reason and there is no opportunity to confess. In this case, the person is to remember the obligation to make an act of perfect contrition, which includes the resolution of confessing as soon as possible. The Eastern Code of Canon Law, Canon 711, states, quote, A person who is conscious of serious sin is not to celebrate the Divine Liturgy nor receive the Divine Eucharist unless a serious reason is present, and there is no opportunity of receiving the sacrament of penance. In this case, the person should make a perfect act of contrition, including the intention of confessing as soon as possible. Canon 712 states, those who are publicly unworthy are forbidden from receiving the divine Eucharist. The purpose of these canons is to prevent grave sin on the part of the person unworthily receiving the Eucharist, to prevent scandal, and to prevent the desecration of the sacrament by such unworthy reception. These canons are still in force. They cannot be validly repealed, because their content expresses the divine law concerning the Eucharist that is taught in the Holy Scriptures and sacred tradition. This has been pointed out in the Declaration of June 24, 2000 by the Pontifical Council for Legislative Texts concerning the admission to Holy Communion of faithful who are divorced and remarried. The Code of Canon Law establishes that, quote, those upon whom the penalty of excommunication or interdict has been imposed or declared, and others who obstinately persist in manifest grave sin are not to be admitted to Holy Communion. See Canon 915. The prohibition found in the cited canon by its nature is derived from divine law and transcends the domain of positive ecclesiastical laws. The latter cannot introduce legislative changes which would oppose the doctrine of the Church. The scriptural text on which the ecclesial tradition has always relied is that of St. Paul. Quote, this means that whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily sins against the body and blood of the Lord. A man should examine himself first, only then should he eat of the bread and drink of the cup. He who eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks a judgment on himself. Pope Francis has indicated by his words and actions that he holds the view expressed by the natural meaning of the words of desiderio desiderave cited above. In his Angelus for the Feast of Corpus Christi on June 6, 2021, Pope Francis said, quoting him, There is another strength that stands out in the fragility of the Eucharist, the strength to love those who make mistakes. It is on the night he is betrayed that Jesus gives us the bread of life. He gives us the greatest gift while he feels the deepest abyss in his heart. The disciple who eats with him, who dips the morsel in the same plate, is betraying him. Betrayal is the worst suffering for one who loves. And what does Jesus do? He reacts to the evil with a greater good. He responds to Judas's no with the yes of mercy. 
He does not punish the sinner, but rather gives his life for him. He pays for him. When we receive the Eucharist, Jesus does the same with us. He knows us. He knows we are sinners, and he knows we make many mistakes. But he does not give up on joining his life to ours. He knows that we need it, because the Eucharist is not the reward of saints. No, it is the bread of sinners. This is why he exhorts us, do not be afraid, take and eat. The statement that the Eucharist is not the reward of saints, but the bread of sinners, might be understood in an orthodox sense if taken in isolation. However, placed in the context of the reception of the Eucharist by Judas, referred to in the Angelus Address, see John chapter 13, verse 23 to 27, and in the context of Pope Francis's other words and actions, it suggests that renunciation of sin is not necessary for one's reception of the Eucharist to be acceptable to God. This view is borne out in the following statement from Desiderio Desiderave, quoting the document. Indeed, every reception of communion of the body and blood of Christ was already desired by him in the Last Supper. The teaching of the Council of Trent cited above condemns the position of Martin Luther on faith and justification. Pope Francis has publicly expressed his agreement with the condemned positions of Luther. In an in-flight press conference on June 26, 2016, Pope Francis stated, I think that Martin Luther's intentions were not mistaken. He was a reformer. Perhaps some of his methods were not right. Although at that time, if you read Pastor's history, for example, Pastor was a German Lutheran who experienced a conversion when he studied the facts of that period, he became a Catholic. We see that the church was not exactly a model to emulate. There was corruption and worldliness in the church. There was attachment to money and power. That was the basis of his protest. He was also intelligent and he went ahead, justifying his reasons for it. Nowadays, Lutherans and Catholics and all Protestants are in agreement on the doctrine of justification. On this very important point, he was not mistaken. On the day that Desiderio Desiderave was issued, Pope Francis received in audience, the person that I have to call here, Lady Moloch, who is the head of one of the chambers of the U.S. Congress. She has been publicly forbidden to receive communion under Canon 915 by her ordinary, Archbishop Salvatore Cordelione. The grounds for this measure were her consistent political support for the complete legalization of the uh, <clears throat> Moloch ritual. After the audience with Pope Francis, she received communion at a mass in St. Peter's over which Pope Francis presided, causing scandal to Catholics all over all the world. When asked her about her illegal reception of communion, Pope Francis expressed no disapproval of it. Instead, he responded by saying, quote, When the church loses its pastoral nature, when a bishop loses his pastoral nature, it causes a political problem. That's all I can say. This response rebukes Archbishop Cordelione for his justified application of Canon 915. The Apostolic Letter Desiderio Desiderave is not an infallible teaching because it does not satisfy the necessary conditions or an exercise of papal infallibility. The Canon of the Council of Trent is an exercise of the infallible teaching authority of the Church. Therefore, the contradiction between Desiderio Desiderave and the defined doctrine of the Council of Trent does not falsify the claim of the Catholic Church to be infallibly guided by the Holy Spirit when, by an exercise of her teaching office, she requires all Catholics to believe a doctrine as being divinely revealed. On the possibility of a Pope publicly teaching error, see the Correctio Filialis, addressed to Pope Francis by a number of Catholic scholars, link is included, and I'll try to remember to put that in my show notes today at returntotradition.org. And the discussions in the book Defending the Faith Against Present Heresies, published by Aruka Press in 2021. No Catholic can believe or act upon a papal pronouncement that contradicts the divinely revealed Catholic faith. We, the undersigned, confess the Catholic faith concerning the worthy reception of the Eucharist, as it is defined by the Council of Trent, according to which faith alone is not a sufficient preparation for receiving the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist. We encourage all the bishops and clerics of the Catholic Church to publicly confess the same doctrine about the worthy reception of the Eucharist and enforce the related canons in order to avoid grave and public scandal. 
signed with a long list of names, and that's the end of the document. You see the list of signatories begins, and at the top of that are, list are Bishops Joseph Strickland, Bishop Emeritus Cresida, Bishop Mitzeritz, uh, Athanasius Schneider, as well as Father James Altman. And then following that are numerous Catholic laity, including scholars and those with high profile positions in the Catholic world. That's to be expected, as is, frankly, France is ignoring this document at best, and at worst, lashing out at the bishops and priests who signed the document. That is to be expected. That is in keeping with him. But also what was to be expected was a quick response to the statement. I'll focus on one from a blog and news outlet that is so pro-Francis that it should be held in the same regard as a national Catholic reporter. And that outlet is Where Peter Is, a site that in a separate article, the proprietors claim to have started they started that website to help counter the quote-unquote incalculable damage caused by Cardinal Burke and the Dubia. They also claim to be Ratzingerian in their nature. Okay then, that site published an article by Robert Fastigi titled, Does Pope Francis Contradict the Council of Trent? Where the author claims that the signatories of this statement are wrong, that Francis giving unrepentant public sinners the Eucharist, and in so doing helping them eat and drink their own condemnation in the words of the Apostle, in doing all that, Francis is not rejecting the Council of Trent. Yeah, quoting that article. I think the signers of the statement have taken the cited passage of the Holy Father out of its proper context. The Holy Father is speaking about the desire of Christ for all to be united with him in the heavenly banquet of the Supper of the Lamb. This is clear from his references to Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. In number four and Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, and number five of Desideo Desideravi. The wedding garment of faith is required for entrance into the banquet, but number five of Desideo states that, quote, the church tailors such a garment to fit, to fit each one with the whiteness of a garment bathed in the blood of the Lamb. See, Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. We should assume that the way the church tailors this wedding garment takes note of the possibility of losing the whiteness of the garment by mortal sin. Pope Francis has noted this in other texts. After his general audience on March 14th, 2018, he reminded some Polish pilgrims that serious sin makes one unworthy to receive the Eucharist. Moreover, in number six of Desirio, the Holy Father speaks of the need for, quote, the most demanding asceticism in approaching the Mass. What Trent teaches in Canon 11 of its decree on the sacrament of the Eucharist, see Denzinger, uh, number 1661, is certainly true. I don't see Pope Francis denying this truth in the passage cited. Trent is talking about the worthy reception of the Holy Eucharist. Pope Francis is speaking about the desire of Christ for all to receive the invitation to come to the Supper of the Lamb. This invitation requires a commitment to missionary outreach, which number five of Desiderio highlights, end quote. Then why did he give Holy Communion to Lady Moloch, knowing that her bishop barred her from that? The author makes a valiant claim, but his signatory statement rests on the undeniable fact that this was couched in the example of that woman I call Lady Moloch receiving the Eucharist from Francis at his Mass, knowing full well that the Church has condemned that practice that she defends, and even condemned the ability of public Catholics from receiving the Eucharist if they are in a state of public manifest sin, especially on that subject. It's a non-negotiable. Lady Moloch, whose name I can't say on YouTube without getting punished by our totally fair hosts, was not even mentioned in his article. It's kind of a big omission from an outlet calling itself Ratzingerian, and followers of John Paul II, especially since those two popes rightly rejected the ability of manifest sinners, like the woman we're talking about, especially on that topic, from receiving the Eucharist. Curious what you think of the signing of statements like this by Bishop Strickland, Father Altman, and numerous lady, including myself, yes. Yes, we all signed that statement, knowing that at best, Francis would continue to ignore it, with the hopes that others would take some kind of public stand in defense of Catholic orthodoxy, given that there is precious little else anyone can do against the errors of Francis and the errors that he openly promotes, at least until some of the better bishops decide to take more proactive action, which they're the only ones who can do. Let me know in the comments what you thought of the statement or the ones that have come out since it, say against it since, well, you know, they're coming out a whole lot and make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't it really does help and share this on social media if you can as well that helps a lot as well as always pray for the church i'm anthony stein
Ave Maria.